Hey, good morning, Benny. It's Friday morning, October 2nd. Privileged to have Chris Moore, our fire behavior analyst, back with us today to help you all plan. A couple quick notes. First, want to update folks on the evacuation order areas and the warning areas. We'll start at the top of the map. Hay Fork and High Palm are not in a warning, but should be and are prepared because they're good, smart, fire savvy communities who know that there's an almost million acre fire right here. So again, now Rowdy Bear in this area, Indian Valley, that's an order. That changed. So Trinity County has said that's an order. Peanut is in a warning. So that for those of you folks and including the nice folks at the convenience store who asked, Peanut's in a warning. Wildwood, not so much. We have the Zog fire impacting this area here. So Wildwood's in the warning, but it's not in an order, but it's in a tough situation because it's got two fires around it. And then you have, um, th that's gonna also include Deer Look. One question we're gonna have for Chris for sure is Governor Newsom had predicted yesterday that these two fires might merge. But we also wanna remind folks that Hentonshaw, Ruth Lake, this whole area, Xenia, all this, Kettenbaum is in orders. And for folks who have property or property damage or questions about that and requesting access, we are not going to facilitate access into evacuation ordered areas. So once the situation stabilizes and we get to a place where it's back to a warning, then those facilitated trips, at least for this incident, for these teams, that's the direction we've been given that we won't be giving facilitated access to closed areas. A couple other things, we have Pacific Northwest Team 2, a Type 1 incident management team, our sister team. They're gonna be starting to assume command of the west side of the fire, including the Ruth Valley area. That'll be transitioning over the weekend. That's fantastic, so we'll start to introduce that more tomorrow. And Chris, we got a lot of folks planning. We have really good communication with our friends like Jennifer, Lee, and Mary up in Hyapalm. We have Cedar and folks out here and Rowdy Bear. We wanna help them plan today, mm -hmm. right? want to help them understand what the fire behavior is going to do. Um, so in general, I just want to talk about what's going on in the fire. Fuels from the pine needles all the way up to the big um, rounds of wood, the dead trees that are, are down, are critically dry. Even the live fuels like brush and trees that normally have some moisture in them at this point are so dry that they're burning like they're actually dead. So what we have here is that any time you get any kind of wind that can surface down to the fire and break through the smoke, any kind of sun that breaks down there pretty much does the same thing. It starts to mix the air where the fire is, or if the fire is below some terrain, like fires like to burn uh, uphill much faster than they do downhill, the fire takes advantage of that condition and starts to burn rapidly. It doesn't take much like we saw yesterday north of Xenia, right? We had some northwest winds that kind of caught one of the um, valleys here and kind of pushed the fire south. It wasn't a strong wind, but the fuels are extremely dry and all it takes is some fresh air to come through and this fire took off going to the south. So that is- and that, that did push it into the CAL FIRE zone. It did. So the CAL FIRE team that's been managing the Xenia and Alder Point area is managing that edge as it moves into their zone. Yes, exactly. So, right, it moved up to this ridge top and then it kind of slopped over and uh, we'll see how the winds affect it today. But everything around the fire area, as you all know, you live here, you know it's been a really dry summer, is extremely dry and it doesn't take much for the fire to get up and start moving in a moment's notice. As soon as those conditions surface, those fuels react and the fire reacts to that. So what's happening over here is that smoke overnight sets in. It prevents any of that warming and drying to hit the ground. And then once we start getting that mixing of the smoke out a little bit, the fire begins to get active. Uh, one of the um, things we like to measure is called the probability of ignition. And it's just a measure that if spots land on fuels outside the fire area, what is the likelihood of those spots starting new fires? And at this point, we're at about 90%. So if there are 100 embers that land on either like old logs or pine needles or something, 90 of them will start new fires and that's what's causing problems here. So anytime the fire gets active, a tree goes up in flames, it sends out a bunch of spots, more like almost all of them will start new fires there and start growing that way. So it's very hard for people to get in there and do things. Areas like the picket fire 
A lot of times old fire scars can be um, barriers to fire spread, like the Buck Fire down here from 2017. The fires had a really hard time moving through there. But the Picket Fire was a couple years before there. There's lots of dead standing trees, so those are completely dry. They burn pretty readily. All that, some of that stuff has fallen over and some of the brush has grown back in, so there is now fuel in this fire scar that is allowing fire to spread. One thing with all those snags in there, they're very unstable, especially if they catch fire. So it's really hard to get people into old fire scars because the safety hazard is significant with the amount of dead standing trees. And then if they catch fire, they're even more unstable. So this is a tough area to put people into work. And uh, as conditions, as that um, sun comes in or that wind comes down, even areas that have burned in the last five years will um, start to show some fire behavior in there. And we did have some folks uh, comment on our Facebook page this morning uh, that they can see some fire activity on the Picket Ridge here area in Ruth. And we did talk to Karen Scholl, the operations chief, who wanted us to communicate to everybody out there who's concerned uh, that there are dozer lines that are above the road. The goal is not to bring it down to the road in the marina area. There are dozer lines above the road. Chris just mentioned there's snag patches and dangerous areas where the fire is burning right now. But as that fire comes down, We'll catch it on the road and then yesterday and we have videos of this going up this morning and last night we do have hose lays now all the way up to the 36 so all the homeowners and residents from the 36 turn down to journey's end loads of hose came in the crews were laying it all out yesterday and the day before with gated y's and porta tanks mm -hmm. so this area is now fully plumbed in here they've been roving around doing mop up they've been doing they've been trying to get some fire line in as well it's been a very dynamic situation yeah. When I drove up the 36 yesterday and got out of the choking smoke in Forest Glen where crews have been still mopping up in that carbon monoxide patch and I got up that little gap wind that you mentioned, I saw some trees flaring up, pulled over to check them out, pulled out the hard hat and got my situational awareness because when folks ask when this road's going to be open, it is extremely sketchy right now when you have those fire weakening trees yeah. catching that wind and that highway creates a little corridor, they can spark up that snag spotted over the road yesterday caused a little problem for firefighters mike defreeze put out a video last night late night that showed those fire crews hiking out to deal with those spots we do have the night shift here we do have the day shift here yes so for so go ahead even fire personnel going through the 36 corridor we have to get ex escorted now because the the situation around the road corridor is so dynamic they want to make sure that as people go through they make it through safely and there's no hazards down across the road as we as also we cross that fire area it's occurred to me a few times i don't have a chainsaw with me yeah same and with these me. trees sometimes are so big two and three and four feet and they do come crashing down in fact when i was stopped waiting for that crew to cross they were falling one of those big old trees and yep. boy when it crashed it crashed huge and that will become more of a problem it, it will and like i said before those um standing dead trees the ones that died from the earlier fire are very unstable naturally and then as soon as they're they're completely dry so as soon as they catch on fire those roots that are remaining there they start to burn out and that trees those trees become um, even more unstable and can fall over at even with a slight gust of uh, wind they are more susceptible to falling over great we do have a zoom meeting for the folks in Hyatt palm today that uh, link and password are going around. If you need it, go ahead and email or call our information unit. The number is always included in the post and we'll send it to you. We did get a call from our friends in Rowdy Bear. They are moving the elders out today and the children. Very good call. Chris, this drainage here, you know, a, a lot of us have fought fire all over the country and what have you. There's always unique local perspectives. The High and Palm folks are very fire savvy. They kind of have a prediction as to how this canyon is going to work. And there is a wind effect that actually sometimes blows down. Yep the canyon right and pushes the fire kind of somewhat away from town. Yeah. So these large features like drainages, they can either funnel the wind or they can block the wind. So if we get winds from the north or northwest, it can funnel up. And we've heard from locals who say that, yes, there's our strong up canyon winds that come and affect the fire. And if the wind is blowing against the fire, it has a harder time spreading north. The thing that we want to pay attention to is that if that wind stops and turns into a down canyon wind, that works in uh, against us. So we are paying attention. We know that these large drainage features have those strong channeling effects. And we've heard from locals that there are strong up canyon and also down canyon winds. So everyone is aware that this large feature goes straight into High and Palm and uh, has the potential to either help or cause some problems for us.
We do appreciate your support out there. You are doing the virtual trap line for us. What that means is we email the store owner and the bar owner our updates, smoke report, maps. They print them out for the community. Thanks for doing that. Maintain your social spacing today when you're watching the Zoom meeting. Please don't all congregate at the bar there. The intent is that you can watch it on your devices. We just password protect our Zoom meetings because there's this phenomenon called Zoom bombing, and we don't want some teenage punk kid jumping in the Zoom meeting and disrupting it. So that's why there's a password. It's not to limit access. We want to make sure you know that. And our Rowdy Bear folks, thank you for paying attention. Thank you for staying connected to us. We really appreciate that. Our friends in Hay Fork, we know it's been very smoky. We know you're very aware with the fire camp burgeoning. There's a lot of equipment in there. Yeah. When you're starting to see the excavators and you're wondering what the excavators are doing, they're getting ready to do more of the repair piece. But our big masticators and feller bunchers, those mechanical tree cutters, they can help us cut fire line and remove fuels and mitigate our hazards along the highway here. We did talk to some folks in Post Mountain who have added 360 sprinklers to around their houses and structures. And they did comment how that humidity bubble is almost, it only takes a few hours to start sensing what that humidity bubble is going to do around a structure. Yeah, the <clears throat> right fire is dictated by fuels, weather, and topography, and that weather piece is temperature and relative humidity. So if you have a, uh, your property and you're worried about it, one good thing you can do is run sprinklers around there, and like Kale said, it raises the relative humidity. It gets moisture back into the environment around your house, which has been lacking here for the last four months. So running those sprinklers regularly, if you can, is a good way to help try and green up that grass, increase the relative humidity, and that makes the conditions there much less favorable for fire spread. Yeah, it's a technique we use at Alaska quite a bit. And one of the reasons why I wanted to make sure Chris always has a chance to talk to you is because planning is everything. Our goal is to give you the best information, to respond to your questions, to be there for you so we can all get through this together. Mike, you have any questions from the audience? Just one, one question regarding um, structure protection, and it kind of ties into what you were just talking about in terms of what does what can structure protection do? Okay, great, yeah. So from a fire behavior standpoint, you want to remove the fuel away from your structure, right? We're Whether raking, right? Raking Everything. those pine needles, those pine cones, um, raising that relative humidity, watering things if you can. If you have firewood stacked up against your house or near your deck or under your deck, those are fuels and they are very dry. Um, I don't know if you get uh, snow in this area, but if when you get windy snow that happens in the winter where that snow kind of accumulates is also where embers can kind of accumulate. So anything on your roof, the eaves, anything that can catch pine needles can possibly catch embers as well. So cleaning all that up, trying to remove anything that can burn from around your house and then sprinkling if you have that option to change the weather dynamic that's in that local area. And what will our structure protection do for people who are not in their homes? Yep, so good example. So for example, yesterday in the Ruth Valley area, what the engine crews have is now miles, additional miles of hose lay, just like they have additional miles of hose lay around the dozer line. And what the hose lay does is allow the pumps in the river or pumps in a port tank to deliver significant amounts of water. They've been removing some of the fuels around people's homes. And some folks really deserve some kudos. They did a great job living in a fire prone area and, and dealing with their house ahead of the summer over the years of removing fuel, creating that defensible space. Other homes in that area, and I will be very frank here, when I drove down the Ruth Road to the store and you look at where some of the fire damage is, there are just hundreds of trees in people's yards and it didn't look like to me like the canopies necessarily burned yeah. uh, and tree torch. It was mainly a flashy fuel, the, the pine needles add up, the pine cones add up. So our fire crews will be in there adding humidity. They'll be in there with the hose lays and then they'll be building off of what some homeowners have already helped them do. And you'll, whenever you talk to an engine crew, they will always tell you specifically which structures are, are more easy to defend. Mike? Uh, someone just wants to know, what is the current RH? And maybe that's probably something to just point out. If we're current relative humidity. We know it's dry, right? <laughs> um, I don't know what it is off the top of my head. I've been getting ready for briefings and things like that, and that's what the meteorologist talks about. But I think... Yeah, go ahead and check it that. It has been in the, the teens and critical fire weather component here, and that's in part because that fog marine layer hasn't been able to really help us out or we haven't had a rainstorm or anything. So today it's forecast to get down to 15%, which is um, extremely dry. And one of the other things that we watch for is what happens overnight. 
overnight, we, uh, most of the time the air loses temperature, it cools off, and that RH comes up. But what's been happening, especially in the mid and the upper layers here, is that RH hasn't come up overnight. It hasn't recovered as we refer to it. So it stayed relatively dry, and that means that the fire can continue burning overnight because those conditions still exist to support fire spread. The tree roots burning underground? Someone just was saying, I don't understand. How did that happen? So what happens is you these strong stand or these dead standing trees catch fire and they burn both up and down as the fire um, progresses. So any wood, even the roots in these standing dead trees are dry. So if there are pine needles on the ground, anything like that, it, those, those roots down there are also quite dry and can burn. Another thing that happens is the um, litter and stuff that is around the base of the tree can burn away and that reduces the stability for those roots to grab on and hold on to and stay standing upright. So yes, it, it, that standing dead tree from the roots all the way down in the bottom all the way to the top is extremely dry and can burn no problem. Some of those roots burning can cause what we call ash pits. Mm -hmm. And the one reason why after the fire is always dangerous, even going into the winter, is because you'll have the root burn out underneath the ground, maybe two or three feet, but you don't necessarily see it, and you'll step in. And that's why firefighters wear fibrum soles. We have Velcro and Nomex around our boots, and we have leather boots at a minimum of eight inches, because that is a real phenomenon and a real problem. Now, do roots burn from tree to tree and spread the fire forever? Not no. so much. But it's a good question, and you will see in a, in a stump area the roots going in, and what we'll do is we'll either mix it with water or dirt. Dirt can put out fires. I want to make sure we're breaking this down for folks. If a firefighter doesn't have a five-gallon um, Fedco or a, we call it a, a PPAC, where they spray the water on or an engine, we can mix mineral soil and dirt with the coals, with the remaining embers, and mix that up until it actually loses yeah. its ability to con con continue to combust. Yeah. We refer to it as a, as a stump hole, right? The tree falls over, there's still the stump remaining, but there's still heat in there, so it'll eventually just burn out every, all the fuel that is available and uh, cause, like Kyle said, big, long areas that are burned out until you walk up there and you step and you realize that there's nothing under you. We have particular knowledge of them in Alaska because they'll get buried by the snow and they'll often what we call overwinter in our country in the Arctic. And so in the spring, after a big wildfire, we go back and we'll find areas of heat that have survived all winter yeah. under maybe two feet of snow at minus 40 degrees. It's a pretty interesting phenomenon. Chris, thank you so much for joining us again. Thank we you. want to give a shout out to Chris's wife who lets him come out here and be our <laughs> specialist for three weeks. He has much, you know, many duties at home, his home unit. And um, I brought a little bit of humor in there because we do have families back home who are supporting everybody you see here. We have a very strong information crew who's been working really hard. We're looking forward to joining forces with our sister team, Pacific Northwest Team 2. Again, they're being in briefed right now. And just like we had the south zone and the north zone and the west zone, they're coming into the south zone and they're also going to be able to assume some of the command of this west zone. So that's a really nice, especially at this point in the season, yeah. to get our sister team in here. They bring a lot of horsepower, and they'll be transitioning and taking this by about Sunday. So tomorrow you'll hear more about that. But that transition's underway, and we want to thank all the families who have firefighters out here. They're working hard. They're getting their good hot meals again. The camps are set up again. So both bike camps are serving hot meals. They're able to take their first shower in days and get that good, rounded, balanced meal. And we thank you for be in there for us. Community, please help each other. Please respect our closures. And as always, ask your questions. We're here to serve you. Thank you.